Okay, welcome to Facebook Live. This is Steve Barrett from PR Week, Editor-in-Chief. Uh, we're about to record our weekly podcast, The PR Week. I'd like to have a guest in the studio, Cathy Renner from Target Q. Hi, Cathy. And Frank Washcook, who's our uh, normal um, ombre. Bad ombre? Um, ombre. Good ombre. Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we're going to talk about a few topical issues and also ask Cathy to talk about Target Q and the general topic of uh, sexuality and communications. Um, we often talk about gender and, and um, ethnic diversity and, and it, that side of things is a, just as important. So we'll, we'll talk about that and uh, a few topical subjects. So we're going to kick off and get going. If you've got any questions or comments you want to attach, please send them through the stream and uh, we'll do our best to reflect them either before or afterwards. And um, yeah, let's, uh, let's get going. Hello and welcome to the PR Week, PR Week's regular weekly roundup of everything that matters in the worlds of PR and communications. My name's Steve Barrett, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of PR Week. I'm going to guide you gently through the next 15, maybe 20 minutes as we uh, pick up on the big topics of the week and also have a special guest in the studio, very pleased to welcome Cathy Renner from Target Q. Hi Cathy. Hi, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. Thanks for joining us. And we've got Frank Washcook. PR Week's news editor, our regular good ombre. Good ombre. Who is always, to... always happy to be on board. Yes, always, always happy to have you. And thanks for filling in for me on my various travels over the past few weeks. We did our best. Nobody's noticed the, uh, the any gap in service. In fact, some <laughs> might say it's been improved. Um, so we're going to talk about Cathy's uh, project, and we're going to talk about our Influencer 50, Health Influencer 50, which is launching over the next few days. We're launching 10 at a time. It's the top 50 influencers in the health space, special health issue that we're doing in partnership with Medical Marketing Media, our sister title, and uh, a great initiative it is, and there's a lot of great content in there. We'll talk about a really interesting appointment at United Airlines. Uh, they've appointed a chief storyteller, and uh, judging from the traffic, that's been a really interesting story, and one that you want to find out more about. Ecom. Am I saying that right, Frank, or is it Acom? I say A-E-com. A-E-com. It might okay. be that none of us are right. We should have found that out before this podcast, shouldn't we? But we didn't. Sorry, listeners. Um, anyway, there's a promotion over there. <laughs> and Caplo has bought an agency. Uh, we'll find out a bit about that, creative agency. And maybe I'll chat a little bit about the PR Week UK Awards if we've got time at the end. So let's get into it. Cathy, tell us um, a little bit about As I was saying um, to our Facebook Live listeners on the uh, live stream, you know, everyone talks about gender diversity and ethnic diversity, and those are really important issues, but not so much about the whole LGBT element and sexuality within the communications industry. I mean, do you think there's as big a problem in diversity in that area in, in this industry? And, and just tell us a little bit about how your uh, target cues plays into that. Sure. Um, well, I mean, I've been doing this uh, as a consultant, a professional business person, for about uh, 15 years now. Before that, I was a glad the Gay and Lesbian yeah. Alliance Against Defamation. and So I, I'm really more of a media activist in many ways than a, a publicist per se or a communications person per se. But I think there have always been a lot of LGBT people in the communications yeah. world. Um, and I think we're starting to see more, not just interest, but very intentional outreach. In fact, if you look at you know big firms like MWWPR, they have an LGBT practice. Um, even when I was briefly <coughs> at Fenton Communications, they worked to have an LGBT practice. I think that there's an understanding that it's about both you know, potential clients and issues and, and, and uh, organizations that you can work with, and it's also about the hiring. Because do, having an LGBT practice and not having it staffed in part, at least, a uh, large part by LGBT community members would make it kind of hard to do the work. It's very specialized, very niche, and, and, and you know, I would say complex in a good way and also sensitive. Yeah. In, in terms of politics. And in those 15 years, how have you seen things change? Because um, we've recently, the last couple of years, you know, you've got things like Tim Cook taking over as CEO of Apple. Mm -hmm. You've got businesses making big statements about, well, we're, you, we're not going to put a, a plant in your state if you continue with those discrimin discriminatory sure. laws. Do you think things are getting better on that front? You know, and, and what role has business got to play in that? Well, I, I in the 25 years I've been working on behalf of the community, it's just extraordinary how much things have changed. I mean, you know, it was not that long ago, you know, less than 10 years ago, 
where it was difficult to find uh, corporations that would really, uh, in a substantive way, sponsor uh, LGBT organizations, events, uh, you know, and work with uh, work with the community. Now it's a battle, you know, to be uh, the top of the heap on the human rights campaign equality index, which is where they where they uh, basically rank and rate corporations uh, all over the country, all over the world, uh, on their practices, on their staffing and their diversity outreach, and um, you know, on, on the products that they, they create. Um, and so I, I think it's been an absolute sea change. And that is part and parcel of what I think is the larger cultural change. We've seen tremendous media visibility. We've seen people coming out much more, uh, much more uh, comfortably, more family support. Uh, we've seen more diversity. We, you know, initially, it was uh, most of the visibility was really around gay white men. Part of that may be, uh, and, uh, and probably is, really uh, growing out of the AIDS epidemic and that really being the, the, the thing that really forced this country and the world in many ways to look at the LGBT community. Now you see a lot more diversity. I mean, you could turn on Modern Family and you see young transgender actors. I would have never thought that would be possible. Uh, you know, even now, after all the work we've done, so it's it's pretty uh, it's pretty incredible. Do you yeah. do you worry about complacency at all? In that, uh, after the big Supreme Court decision last year, maybe people feel that uh, you know the battle's over, so to speak. It's it's a really really important question. Uh, I think there was that fear, mm -hmm. and I think what we've seen is that the communities kind of come together and said, "We're not done," and it's not that we need to start working on other issues. We've been working on the other issues, but. The, uh, the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which I worked on, and Marriage Equality, which I also worked on, they kind of sucked all the air out of the room in terms of visibility and in some ways funding. But now, like for example, last week I was at a gala for the Ali Pernay Center, which is based here in New York City, largest organization in the country working with homeless LGBT youth. 40% of the kids on the street are LGBT, usually disproportionate to the population, right? People are getting it. We had, we, the place was overflowing, they raised hundreds of thousands of dollars. Sandra Bernhardt was our host, and, and you know, a ton of politicians were there to be supportive. So I think the community is understanding that we're not done. There are, there are seniors, there are youth, um, there are issues of intersection in our community related to race and gender and age, um, economic status, where there are a lot of people in our community who are definitely, you know, there's still a lot of fight there. Yeah, because if you look at, um you know, sometimes we're in a bit of a bubble in maybe in New York or mm -hmm. in Chicago sure. or San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And if you look at, the, say, the Trump effect where uh, Trump gets a lot of his support, they're not in that bubble, are they, uh, those um, communities? I mean, do you think there are differences regionally in, in attitudes to, to the whole LGBT issue? It's, it's hard to say. Certainly there are places where there are larger, more out visible populations. But, you know, hate crimes, uh, discrimination, uh, you know, homophobia is an issue here in New York City as much as can be in other places. I think what's interesting is that more people are coming out in those places, in more rural, um, suburban settings, and that is what is, I think, helping move the larger population. Because it's not just, oh, somewhere in San Francisco, or oh, those gay people in New York. They're your next door neighbors. They work next to you. They live next to you. Their kids go to school with your kids. And so there's a whole different level of awareness. And that, I th has, think, has made a tremendous difference. What about working in communications? You know, a lot of people say about ethnicity or gender that, that you know, there are 70% of women working in PR. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of um, ethnic diversity at junior levels, but that's not, doesn't always work through to the most senior levels of organizations. Do you see that as, as similar in LGBT? Well, it's interesting because I think, you know, being LGBT is sort of being an invisible minority in some ways. So you have people who may be at the upper echelons who are not out, right? And then, you know, it's still an issue in over 30 states around the country that you can fire someone because they're gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgender. And so coming out actually can be very risky. So we've got some issues to deal with, I think, before we're able to, uh, you know, address some of these issues of having diversity within um, certain parts of the of the business world, including communications. Yeah, yeah. Now you helped us get Edie Windsor as our communicator of the year yes. um, a couple of years ago. Thank she you for doing that. Yes. Um, tell us a bit about Target Q. You know, what, what, are you, what are you doing there and what are you, what's your sure. mission and objectives there? Um, Target Q is a public interest firm and we work really exclusively on LGBT and HIV related issues. And so I work mostly with not-for-profit organizations, um, 
I also work with authors, filmmakers, um, theater productions, and individuals like Edie, uh, who are really hoping that they can get their story out there in a way that's useful. Um, like I tell people, what I do at Target Q is not that different than what I did at GLAD, because my goal is not just to get media visibility or get someone's name in the paper. It's really about good coverage. It's about stories, because when I work, for example, now with organizations that work with transgender youth or homeless LGBT youth, there's a lot of education that needs to happen when you're talking to journalists. It's a whole nother level of work that you, you don't have to do in certain areas of communication. You don't have to, you know, explain to a journalist what toothpaste is for, right? I mean, you can just sell, you know, you can market your toothpaste. Um, but this is very different. And so, it, you know, I continue to work with a lot of populations that are looking for visibility, like seniors, like Edie, you know, in and of her, just her own presence, and she recently remarried, so she's a, a happy newlywed uh, again. Yes, 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 yeah, there's still hope. There's still hope for us when we're in the late <laughs> 80s. Late 80s, um, she's fantastic uh, and unstoppable. But, you know, just the fact that we have more diversity vis and visibility of the different parts of our community that you haven't seen very much of, those, those are my clients. You know, parents with transgender kids, seniors, uh, people of color in the community, whether Latino, African American, Native American. And there's still issues that we need to talk about, like hate crimes and discrimination. Um, you know, this whole issue of the, the bathroom uh, mm -hmm. laws yeah. that, you know, are, they're really not about that. They're about people in this country really not knowing what it means to be transgender. So we're at, we're kind of in a space right now where we're talking about those issues in the way I used to talk about gay issues you know, probably uh, 10, 15 years ago. Or as I, I said to a journalist the other day, um, uh, what's between your legs is the new what do you do in bed? I mean, there are, people are asking like these really basic, somewhat obnoxious questions, but they're asking because they they don't know. They just, you know, they, it's like when a reporter asks you a question and you get kind of offended and that reporter really is asking because they know that yeah. their audience is interested in finding out. And, and so we're really getting a chance to move beyond um, what I would call appointment discrimination, right? So if you want to serve in the Army or the Navy or the Air Force, and you had to lie. You had to, you had to very intentionally lie about who you were to serve under Don't Ask, Don't Tell. We don't have that problem anymore. If you want to get married, you had to find a partner and, and intentionally go down to the courthouse and get married. The stuff we're working on now, I think, is much more basic. You know, we're dealing with discrimination in places where it's not your choice, okay? Schools, churches. Families, we're working on homophobia and transphobia in places where it's it's even more of an uphill battle. Marriage was uh, don't ask, don't tell were in some ways the sort of easy issues. Now we're dealing with with some real challenges, and it's an exciting time to work on it because I think the the country is is interested and ready. Yeah, well, Mostly. we wish you luck with all that work, <laughs> and uh, like it's, like you were saying with Frank, it's important that complacency doesn't creep in because it's a very important issue. No. All right, so let's get on to some topical stories. Frank, uh, United Airlines sure. um, appointed a chief storyteller, which yeah. is a really interesting post and um, got a load of traffic as well. So that's tell right. us a lot a of people about interested in this. That's uh, their new hire is Dana Brooks Ryan Glass, and she's a veteran of Harpo Networks and uh, the Oprah Winfrey show, also Chicago based, just like United. Really interesting hire. Uh, it really speaks to how companies are taking their storytelling abilities up a notch. I think it's interesting that it's an airline uh, making a hire like this, because if you think about it, airlines have always sort of uh, been in this business when it's the in-flight magazine or things like that. So uh, interesting hire for United, for sure. Yeah, Jim Olson's the head of comms there. He was at Star Starbucks, and he's been there about a year, I think, and an incredible year at United with the CEO, Oscar Munoz, coming in and then having a, a heart transplant. <laughs> Yeah. after only three months on the job. But now he's back and, and uh, uh, attempting a great cultural change there, a really interesting story. Cathy, have you seen that in your sort of time in the profession, the way it's gone from being just ma media relations into brands becoming um, content producers and, oh, and media owners yeah. and new influencers and, yeah. and, and all that stuff? How's that? Both for-profit, right, and not-for-profit. I mean, that's, that's actually a wonderful thing for not-for-profit organizations or advocacy groups because... With social media, you can create your own media. You can stream live on Facebook. You can have a YouTube channel. You can tweet. You can, um, you know, go on Tumblr. There's so many ways to reach people, and kind of like, 
you know, skip the middle person. I mean, to me, media is still a really, really important way to reach a general audience. But for really targeted audiences, social media has been great. Yeah, you still can't beat a piece in the Times or on uh, yeah, NBC. Everybody wants to be. On yeah, TV. yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, interesting po uh, appointment, and we'll see how that uh, pans out. Wanted to talk a little bit about the PR Week special health issue, which is coming out on Tuesday. A lot of the content is already online, but there'll be some big features, and we have a, an inaugural Health Influencer 50, which is the top 50 power players, if you like, in that space. And we're doing that in partnership with our sister title, Medical Marketing and Media. And uh, I hope you're going to enjoy the content. Some really fantastic stuff there. And Really, the drive behind that was uh, talking to agencies. You know, some of them are doing 40 to 50 percent of their billings in health-related endeavors. And uh, it, you know, Edelman is about 20 percent, but 20 percent of Edelman is you know, over 200 million dollars. <laughs> so it's a big part of communications. And from and, and there are so many issues that are big national issues like drug pricing, like the Affordable Care Act, like new technology, and uh, you know how younger generations approach healthcare. You know, very different way and they want that personal relationship with their doctor etc so um, we hope you like it it's a, a lot of work went into it across the two teams and um, we're actually unveiling the influencer 50 10 by 10 we started on Wednesday that's going to go through to next Tuesday for the, the top 50 but um, how does help I mean what what's your view on the health industry there's a there's a sort of dichotomy between developing drugs mm -hmm. that are going to cure illnesses and making money, you know, and that sometimes yeah. the research doesn't always go, you know, it doesn't always, it was interesting with the ALS thing, wasn't it, that mm -hmm. it was great to see that all that money that had been raised has actually changed things and improved things, right. you know, one year on, and that's that's good to see because it was an, it, it was an unfashionable illness, if you like, wasn't it? Well, you don't have to talk to me, I used to march with ACT UP in Washington, they, people would chain themselves to the FDA fence yeah. because the AIDS drugs were not coming along. I mean, I think in the LGBT community, one of the interesting things about the health issues in general is that, I mean, a lot of us, obviously, as people are super invested in the Affordable Care Act and access to insurance and all of those things, but it's also about, you know, HIV now being a very different disease than it was, you know, a decade ago. People are living full active lives into their, uh, you know, 70s and 80s. In fact, I had a client, um, Equalis, which was a, the first company to offer life insurance to people with HIV in, in decades. They, mm -hmm. People stopped offering it and they're partnered with Prudential. Um, and that was really interesting. But the, the other thing is that AIDS is not the only healthcare issue that affects us as a population. And so that's, to me, been one of the big health, uh, health issues and conversations is, is sort of how, how does cancer affect the LGBT community? How do doctors treat people in the community how, with culturally competent care? So in other words, not putting me through you know, a half an hour conversation about birth control because it doesn't really apply. Um, you know, but how to make people sensitive about that and transgender issues, absolutely. That's just a huge health field, mental health field that uh, it, we're going to be seeing a ton of attention on. So. Yeah, it, it's just quickly a slightly parallel point. It was mm -hmm. the, the story about the, it was this, the, always understood that there was one person who was the, was at the start of the AIDS epidemic, and there's a story oh, that's the come patient out. Patient zero mythology, patient zero, yeah, yeah. And that's now that. been debunked yep. with, with a story that's saying it was here as maybe right. as early as 1971. Mm -hmm. Do you think that changes the narrative, and how important is it to have a narrative about that, or, or do you think we should be moving on now from that? It's interesting. I haven't seen a lot of the reaction in the HIV AIDS community, but you know, to me, what that patient zero thing was sort of an example of like we have to find somebody to blame. You know, the, the AIDS epidemic was just so horrifying, and so few people know the real history, know how people were like literally left to die. You know, on uh, in hallways, and parents were, and families were not notified, and you know, these young men died in their you know late teens, 20s, and, and 30s, and we lost an entire generation of people. Um, and this country doesn't realize how shameful, how shameful it was for the government to mostly completely ignore it. So, you know, the patient zero thing seems like a, oh, well, that's the guy that started it all. You know, let's blame that gay guy, you know, who was like a flight attendant or yeah. something. You know, I mean, it, it's almost like a mythology made up, you know, to hurt the community. So yeah. I'm kind of glad it's Yeah, no, gone. agreed, agreed. <laughs> um, Frank, a couple of other stories that caught our eye. Uh, yeah, quick rundown. Yeah. Um, 
A notable promotion at AECOM, which is that Heather Rim, who was their head of communications, was also given oversight of marketing, and she becomes the chief communications and marketing officer there. Um, probably works the other way around more often than it works uh, in the top communicator's favor. Uh, so an interesting promotion there. AECOM is a construction giant, uh, one of the biggest companies in Los Angeles, if not the biggest, and one of the biggest companies on the West Coast. That's great to see, actually. Yeah. It's good, because we tend to just talk about, you know, Johnny Watter and a couple of others who cover both and came from the comms background. So there are more and more mm -hmm. communicators who are taking on marketing as well, especially in a B2B environment, to be honest. So that's good to see another one. That's right. And she joined the company about a year ago. Another one. Um, in the first acquisition in its 25-year history, Caplow uh, bought a creative firm called Mayday. Uh, Mayday is a 12-person shop with uh, about 150-plus clients, offices in New York and Philadelphia, and they are in the process of moving into Caplow's office in New York in the next couple of months. So there's, we've seen a lot of consolidation over the last six months, well, last few years, but it seems in the last six months, especially at that smaller agency level, it's, it's mm -hmm. that. And then um, I was thinking of um, the, the Finn Partners acquired uh, LGBT specialist agency in DC, and the name is completely escaping me. It begins with W. Wit? No. Uh, well, they bought Widmire. The Widmire. Oh, Scott Widmire. Scott Widmire. Scott Widmire. Yeah. I actually, I, I worked in, Glad's first office, real office, was in Scott Widmire's office right, in Washington, right. DC. He's great. So I... What do you see as the driving forces behind this consolidation, you know, um, especially at that slightly more mid-size, smaller to mid-size? Yeah, yeah it's, I mean, it's interesting. I think, like I said before, you've got these big firms that are starting LGBT practices, and, and there aren't that many of us with that kind of high-level expertise and, you know, lots of experience in the field. So, uh, you know, I, I happy to, to... Right. Acquiring is one way to do it. I partner with um, other firms sometimes on projects, and... You know, it's uh, you know, it's it's very competitive now, and and more and more people are wanting to do, particularly the marketing piece, towards the LGBT community, and I think that's going to be an area of growth. It's something that I've actually started doing a little bit more of myself because that's where the where the growth is, and that's where the money is. Yeah, no, interesting stuff, and uh, yeah, Capo have been a little bit quiet in mm -hmm. the recent time, so good to see them back in the news and wish them well with that uh, acquisition. So we're nearly at the end of the show. I just wanted to, I was away last week in London at the PR Week UK Awards. Interesting to see the type of agencies winning awards there. Tend to be more creative, boutique shops, small to medium size, very creative work. Um, it, you know, the UK is the second largest PR market in the world, but um, you didn't see so much of the Edelmans, the Webbers, the Ketchums, the Fleischmanns winning. Go, goal in one large agency, but there, there were some really creative shops like Unity and We Are Romans doing some great work, you know, but with, I think Unity won seven awards and they've got 30 to 35 people. So they're a uh, very creative shot. I would advise, ask you, you know, if you're interested, look at look at the case studies, have a look at my blog from last week and there are links through to the winning pieces of work. So some great creative work going on over there. And that doesn't mean the big agencies aren't over there in force and doing great stuff. They are, but it's possible that maybe they're doing regional work for global assignments. So they wouldn't necessarily they would be more relevant to our global awards or, or even our US awards. But it was really interesting to see the different you know, type of work. And they, they appeared to party a bit later than the US <laughs> people. They were still going at 3.30 in the morning, wow. which that's not uh, that's PR Week time. Awards. They're usually sort of all done and dusted by 11 p.m. But anyway, <laughs> I was tucked up in bed by then, I must uh, just emphasize. Um, okay, well, thank you, Kathy, for joining us. It's great you. to have you on the Good podcast and wish you well in your future endeavors. Yep. Frank, thank you for joining us as always. And uh, we'll see you next time on the PR Week. <laughs>